Good here, I'm Dennis Gerhardstein. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. And uh, we have three speakers today. Uh, the Ramsey County Board Chair, Tristan Mata Castillo, um, the Director of Public Health, Sarah Holly, and then lastly will be Ramsey County Attorney John Choi. So let's start off with Commissioner Mata Castillo. Hi, good morning, and thanks for being here today to lift up the importance of our public health crisis of gun violence in our community. Gun locks are important, and I stand here today with County Attorney Choi and Public Health Director Holly in calling on everyone who has a firearm in their home to lock and safely secure their guns. Everyone who chooses to own a firearm has a responsibility to avoid needless tragedies in their own home and to reduce the ways they contribute to other gun violence in our community. With a record number of firearm permits issued in Minnesota in each of the past two years, ensuring guns are safely secured in our homes is important now more than ever. Our goal with this project has been to make gun locks free and easily accessible to our residents. In addition to the gun locks at our public health center, I'm pleased that we are adding locks for residents to pick up when they're at one of our many Ramsey County service centers, downtown at Metro Square in St. Paul, Roseville, and Maplewood service centers. Gun locks are just one of multiple actions that we must take as individuals and through our government to end the epidemic of gun violence that is a public health crisis. It is only through the action on multiple fronts that we can make progress to reduce the violence, injury, and death that occurs in our communities and in our homes from gun violence, accidents, and access by individuals who pose a threat to our community. For too long, we've listened to the voices that say that there's nothing that can be done every time there's a new gun death of an individual or a mass shooting. We can't let hopelessness and despair and the collective toll of each new slaughter of children shoppers in a store, people gathered in prayer at their churches or in community, numb us to the pain and paralyze us from action. There are many common sense steps that we can take that we have taken before in the past that will work to reduce gun violence. The recent proposal by the part bipartisan group of U.S. Senators, as well as previous bills passed in the House, are hopeful signs and good first steps to finally begin to address gun violence on multiple fronts. It's early, and we'll need to see the details of the Senate compromise and the final bill that's passed, but the ideas mentioned so far sound like good first steps. Having time for authorities to do background checks of juvenile and mental health records of any pros prospective gun buyer under the age of 21 is good, as would extending prohibition on guns to domestic violence abusers. Other excellent steps mentioned are the additional funds for states to enact red flag laws to temporarily, temporarily confiscate guns from people deemed to be dangerous as well as money for mental health resources and to bolster safety and mental health services at schools. Several of these ideas are things my colleagues and I have worked on through our National Association of Counties and a resolution we passed last year to address gun violence as a public health crisis. These things are also among the actions that Ramsey County has advocated for in its state and federal legislative agendas. They're good first steps but there are other reasonable things that we must also consider that have widespread support and that would be effective at reducing gun violence. Our county's 2021 federal legislative platform called for the reinstatement of firearm assault weapons ban as a strong step in addressing the epidemic of mass shootings and other gun-related violence. This ban passed with bipartisan support and was effective for a decade. The ban was effective, and when it sunset in 2004, a surge of automatic weapons shootings occurred that has not subsided. At the state level, the county supports mandated background checks for all firearm purchases to reduce firearm-related crime. We also support legislation that reduces gun violence through a community-centered approach to violence prevention, such as our Healing Streets, as well as funding for development of new response types and enhancements to dispatch countywide resources. We call on our community today to join us in asking federal and state legislators to take initial steps and consider these bolder actions to address the epidemic of gun violence. We also call on gun owners to lock and secure their firearms to protect their family members and our entire community. 
We watch each new incident across the country in horror of the moment, and then we move on. Some of us even forgetting the death and injuries that occurred less than a year ago right here in St. Paul at the 7th Street Truck Park mass shooting. We owe it to the victims and survivors of these tragedies to not let, them, let that happen again and to act now. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our Public Health Director and Acting Deputy County Manager, Sarah Hawley. Thank you, Chair Matt Castillo and County Attorney John Choi. It's great to be here with you this morning. I want to lift, first lift up the lives of the people lost to gun violence in our community, the families and friends impacted by this loss and these preventable tragedies, and the survivors in our community that are working to heal from the impact of violence that is often unimaginable. In July of 2020, Ramsey County declared racism as a public health crisis, which officialized the county's stance on this matter and supported the use of public health lens and the dedication of resources to, to the work of dismantling racism within Ramsey County. This is relevant and important today for many reasons as we try to address the issue of gun violence as a public health crisis. One, we have a responsibility to examine the policies and practices that contribute to violence and gun violence in our communities. We must address the root cause of violence and gun violence that contribute, um, sorry, we must address the root cause of violence and gun violence um, that contribute to the determinants of health that lead to many of these tragedies that are rooted in systemic racism, poverty, the lack of health that lead to many of the social determinants that we're seeing here in society. We also need to lift up the issue of mental health promotion and support in our community, and often the lack of social supports that lead to violence and gun violence in our community. Gun locks and, gun locks and safely securing firearms is one piece of the puzzle to address the public health crisis on gun violence. St. Paul Ramsey County welcomes this continued longstanding collaboration with the county attorney's office and other partners in our community to make gun locks free and easily accessible in our community. Residents can visit the Public Health Center at 555 Cedar to pick up a free gun lock at our vital records counter. There are no questions asked when you pick up a gun lock. Our department was involved with this project from the start because preventing illness, injury, and premature death are core public health concerns. We do, we do this through public health education and services that we provide to tens of thousands of people we serve each and every year. Public health serves individuals across the lifespan but the health and safety of infants and children and families are the starting point and foundation of community health. A gun lock can be the difference between life and death if a child accidentally gets a hold of a firearm. We also know addressing the needs of our community also aim to reduce violence overall for our residents here in Ramsey County. One of the important things our public health nurses do as a part of our home visiting program is talking to pregnant and parenting women and families about making their home safe for their baby. This includes making sure that they have a safe place for their baby to sleep, as well as helping them look at any potential safety hazards, poisons, electrical outlets, guns being most important. We talk with parents about the importance of keeping guns locked up and secured, particularly if there are older children in the home. We ask them to keep the ammunition separate from the gun and how, safety, trans, how to safely transport firearms in a vehicle. As a parent, of a eight-year-old. I also know children intensely watch and model everything that we do. So that's why it's not surprising that recent research that involved interviews of gun-owning parents and their children found that 73% of children under the age of 10 knew exactly where their parents had stored their guns. Education is key to preventing children from accessing unlocked guns. That's why we are here today, to alert adults who have children living in or visiting their homes um, to the danger of unsecured firearms, and to let them know about the free gun lock program that they can now easily pick up in the community. If you have a gun, take the time to think about what you can do to avoid a tragedy and save the life and prevent injury. Our work on gun locks is just one way that public health is working to prevent injuries and deaths in our community and address gun violence to, effects, to the effects of all of our community members and how it disproportionately impacts racially and ethnically diverse residents. Our Healing Streets Initiative, which Commissioner Matt Castillo mentioned, is another resource in way public health, Ramsey County, and the city of St. Paul, and our partners are working to address gun violence as a public health crisis. Through the Healing Streets program, we are taking a community-centered, 
healing-based approach to work upstream on violence prevention, intervention, healing, on group and gun violence here in St. Paul and in Ramsey County. Centered in the narratives and lived experiences of those most impacted by group and gun violence, the Healing Streets program works to reduce group and gun violence through direct service work with schools and hospital-based violence prevention, healing, and grief services for survivors of group and gun violence. I also want to mention another county resource um, for individuals um, that are struggling with and healing from violence that the support and services available throughout Ramsey County and through our Ramsey County Crisis and Mental Health Services Unit. The county provides connections to services and resources to put individuals on a path to healing. Help is available in crisis and to get an assessment or to access ongoing mental health services or chemical health services. Information on crisis services and short-term and ongoing mental health services is available at our mental health center and also online at ramseycounty.us backslash mental health. I just want to thank um, County Attorney Choi and Chair Matt Castillo for, for having me here today and lifting up the lives of the people that we have lost to gun violence, but also um, lifting this up as a public health crisis. We can all do this together to end the cycle of violence. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to County Attorney Choi. And thank you, Sarah Holly, for the work that you're doing to prioritize uh, our response uh, to violence and, and really uh, leading around a, a public health lens to uh, address those issues. And thank you, uh, Trista Montes Castillo, our board chair, uh, for joining here today to get some important messages out to our community. As the chief prosecutor, um, oftentimes uh, our office is called, uh, we're at the very, very back end. We're very, very downstream after tragedies uh, have occurred in our community. And too often what we see are things that are preventable. That if we were to think about prevention, if we were to think about actually putting public health strategies at the forefront, some of these uh, issues could possibly be prevented. Uh, as an example, uh, throughout this country, uh, once a week, so every week in America, at least we have one toddler involved fatality, right, uh, in this country. Think about that. So here in our region, in the Twin Cities area, we've already had two really horrific incidents that have occurred uh, over on the other side of the river. But just sad situations where a young toddler or a young person uh, gets a hold of a, a, a gun uh, in the home, uh, maybe it's under the pillow, under the sofa, and then they ended up shooting themselves or a sibling uh, in, the, in an accidental type shooting. But what happens is that uh, we're asked then to pick up the pieces. Oftentimes, uh, we might have to prosecute the person uh, who was negligent in storage, storing that firearm or for child endangerment. And those are just tragic cases uh, where lives have been lost. And those, there's, there's cases here in Ramsey County that have occurred over many, many years. And so that's part of the message here about what we want to avoid. And we really believe that just safe storage, these messages that uh, Sir Holly and Tristan Mas Castillo talked about can actually make a difference so that I don't have to get involved, so the police don't have to get involved, that we can prevent uh, these tragic lives uh, being lost. But that is just one piece of the solution. And those are some of the things that we can do at the local level. Um, and I think uh, what we're trying to also say here as a part of a really important message is that we really need action to take place uh, at the state legislature, at, uh, in our United States uh, Congress. Uh, Krista talked a little bit about some legislation that's pending. There are some good things that are in there, but we need to go further. And we need to call out the, the fact that uh, in our society, in America today, uh, we have tragedies all the time. You know, we, these mass shootings have become a part of who we are a, as Americans, but yet they continue to happen, yet there's no action that occurs afterwards. And I also need to call out the fact that if we look at, uh, in our own community, if we just paused for today and counted all of the, the young people who have lost their lives on an annual basis, we actually have a mass shooting occurring in our community every day. Oftentimes, those uh, victims uh, are, come from black and brown communities, and I think we don't do enough uh, to pause to recognize the lives that are lost uh, to gun violence. And so I can tell you this, is that, uh, and, and people have talked about this over and over again, in our, in our public across the state, I'm not just talking about in Ramsey County, but 80% 
of people support some form of universal background check on transfers. That would make a huge difference around some of the issues that we're experiencing with guns now coming into uh, our community, right? We've had a huge proliferation of guns that have been manufactured, that have been uh, manufactured legally, that have been transferred legally, but then at some point, something falls apart and we've had a massive influx of guns just in our community. More people are getting permits to carry handguns. And so we have this proliferation of handguns and I think there's a lot of things that we could be doing uh, around uh, just reasonable, sensible regulation like red flag laws that had been mentioned before, um, universal background checks, and again, that is supported universally across the state. It doesn't matter whether you live in greater Minnesota or in the Twin Cities. And those are reasonable things that I think could actually make a difference. We have a new uh, emerging issue that um, we need to also be paying attention to, which is the issue of ghost guns. These are guns that are, can be uh, manufactured by uh, uh, some sort of uh, a 3D printer or these kits that are sold on the internet. And these guns are then uh, can be manufactured by the person who purchases the kit and then they won't have a serial number, they won't have a way to trace those particular guns. We've started seeing this nationally where there's a huge influx in cities like Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles where they've had huge amounts of ghost guns that are being recovered. We're starting to see that happen here in the Twin Cities, in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. Uh, and that's another issue that we uh, need to address. Um, I am involved uh, with a group called Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. And we recently uh, wrote a letter, and we'll provide the letter to you, to the, the CEOs of MasterCard and Visa uh, to not process payments um, involving uh, these kits that allow for people to make uh, AR-15s, to make, uh, you know, uh, Glock pistols, those types of things. And so this proliferation of guns needs to be addressed. And we have to also call out the fact that um, what's standing in the way of these sensible regulations is a, is a small special interest group, the National Rifle Association. That has been what has dragged down, I think, our ability to make these changes and I, and I know that people here would join me in that we need to uh, have a call for more courage in this, in this country uh, to be able to stand up to special interests and actually do what is best for the people uh, of our communities and to do something significant uh, around preventing uh, senseless and needless uh, gun violence. So uh, again, thanks to my partners here today and together, um, working with our communities. Uh, I know that uh, we can make some changes here locally, but we still need uh, others to act, and I ask for uh, that action today. Thank you. Any questions? How many gun locks are just ready to go away, and when does that program plan to start? Is that something the court is just kind of as of right now? So the program has been in place for, I don't know, probably since about 2013 or 14. So we've, we've always had gun locks available, but we're, but we're expanding today. We're uh, doing, we have more service centers and locations that we're doing, utilizing in Ramsey County. And the, the locks are you know, very simple. They're just, they're no questions asked, and we, we are uh, distributing them to whoever needs them. Can you well, there's on the online. There's a great video uh, that a sheriff's deputy will go through. But it basically what it is, it's a, it's a cable lock, and the cable lock it's just very simple to use. It just goes right through the barrel, right? Or it goes through. A, it can also be used for a, 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 a rifle too, as well. And there's a demonstration uh, on Ramsey County's website that you can look at. So it's very simple, very inexpensive, and. Uh, they work because this will prevent, um, I think, a young uh, child or anybody, you know, being able to get into that. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could cut it, right? But that the, the purpose is here. Is I, I think this will work to prevent uh, the types of uh, deaths that we're talking about. While we're still talking about gun locks, could you clarify how many locations there were before this expansion and how many there are now? Yeah, I think it's in the press release, but I don't know the exact. Uh, the new locations. There were about 12. Now there's still 12 because we consolidated. Roseville Library became mm -hmm. Roseville Sen Service Center. Maplewood Library, we just shifted them over. So we have about 12 exiting all over the um, county, different sites. And to answer the question, there's about a thousand new locks that will go out to those sites. Some of them have become dormant, but some of them are very regularly used, like yeah. 555. 
And I think this, the current, uh, the amount of locks that we have right now, it's the second flight of locks that we've had to buy. So since the inception of the program, um, we've, made, we've made two purchases and probably have to make a third. You, it was brought up the no record number of gun permits in Minnesota yeah. over the course of the last few years. Are you able to speak to Ramsey County specifically to the gun permits that have been issued in the last few years? I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. The Sheriff's Office would have that and we can also <clears throat> provide that information for you if you're interested. I know that the number of permit holders in the state of Minnesota has dramatically increased, especially over the past uh, two or three years. I want to say that number, well, I, I don't quote me on the number because I'm not certain, but I want to say it's over 300,000 permit holders in the state. And then you mentioned the two incidents in Minneapolis that yep. we've seen over the course of the last few months. Would you say this is in response to that? Or Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so I just want to make it really clear. This just happens as a matter of course, um, where young uh, person gets a hold of a gun and ends up shooting themselves or somebody else. It's just a matter of course. It happens throughout this country, um, and if we can go back and pull the cases, uh, the past cases in Ramsey County, and that's why I have a huge interest in this to prevent all of that because it's just, it's almost like a pattern that we have. And I think if we start taking public health approaches, we can interrupt that pattern. So one of the reasons why we wanted to get this done at this time was that um, school is out now, right? And so with parents oftentimes being at work, we felt that it was a really critical time to get these messages out and, it, and we really appreciate the coverage uh, that we're getting here today so that people know that these locks are available, that they know that um, there's an expectation uh, as part of the law as well as uh, as a community that we are safely and securely storing uh, our firearms that might be within the home and to get the public messages out that guns within a home uh, accelerate the risk of people being injured and so that means in my opinion more responsibility on the part of those who own the guns. And then lastly, I know there's been kind of a massive effort across the river to take <clears> guns <throat> off the street, right, in Minneapolis and Hennepin County and some of the you know, actions over there. Can you speak to that at all in, in Ramsey County in terms of getting illegal guns off the street and maybe any progress that you've seen this year or over the last couple of months? Yeah, well, I, as Sarah talked about this, I think a part of it, I mean, a part of it is trying to get those guns off the streets, right? So that's a lot of what police are, are doing. They're recovering uh, firearms that are, and oftentimes are stolen, right? Um, so the police continue to do that type of work in terms of just recovery of guns when uh, they're about uh, doing their, you know, po policing work. But at the same time, I think it's really critical, and you heard uh, Commissioner uh, Modest Castillo and Sir Holly talk about some of the work that we're doing to interrupt the cycles of violence and utilizing a community-based and public health-based uh, approach uh, to intervene. Because oftentimes what we see with respect to gun violence is that shootings occur amongst groups or they're, they're, there's, uh, there's, a, there's an aspect of it where there's retaliation, right? And so if we have community interveners uh, that are properly trained and resourced, we know that there's a likelihood that there could be some retaliation, right? Or something like that if there's a, a shooting victim that might present, so let's say, at the hospital, right? We can have community interveners get to work right away to try to interrupt uh, what we see, again, as a pattern, as a cycle where you see retaliation. You know, the, the truck stop shooting that we just recently had, um, that was actually a, a, a remnant of some of the retaliatory shooting that goes back probably about a decade. So these cycles um, can be interrupted. We can do intervention. And that's where it's really critical, I think, for a community to recognize that the solutions are not just found in the work that we do to arrest and cover guns and to prosecute, but, but actually uh, working with community, bringing in public health strategies, uh, that work of Healing Streets is very much uh, one that is based in community and it is utilizing public health strategies uh, to be a part of the solution. So 
I think the message that you heard here today is that when we're all pulling together, utilizing all of the various levers that we have, uh, and we're doing a lot of that at the local level, uh, utilizing the enforcement tool, the policing, the prosecution, but also the public health stuff, right? But there's frustration. And the frustration that I think you heard from the chair uh, and you heard from me is that on some of the other things that are out of our control, we are not seeing the change that we need and which, and I want you to hear that as your chief prosecutor, I believe that there's a, a number of pieces of legislation like reasonable red flag laws that could address some of the mental health issues that we have, universal uh, comprehensive background checks on all transfers. Uh, we've got a problem, I think, with some of the transfers that happen over the internet. But having that universal background check, which, by the way, is supported by three out of four or four out of five people in the state of Minnesota, depending on which poll that you're looking at, we need to see those changes because they can actually make a difference. We need, to, we need to address ghost guns. And so we need to see action at the federal level and at the state level. And we'll be there to continue to push um, our um, partners. Sarah. Yeah, so every, as a part of some of the work that we do, I mean, I think public health can speak for like some of the things that they might be tracking, but from our, from our perspective, from a prosecution perspective, um, one of the things that we're always tracking um, in our county, and it's really through the violence reduction leadership group that we have, is uh, the, the shots fired, who's being injured, who's presenting to the, uh, the hospital where these shots are occurring. So we have that data. I don't have it prepared to talk about. But I think showing some of that data would actually be a good thing because people can also see, and this is some of the things that we need to talk about as a community. Oftentimes, those injuries and those shots fired are really, are, are really um, uh, concentrated in certain neighborhoods, right? And I really believe, again, and that really l lends itself to thinking about things from a public health perspective, like what can we do in those communities then to try to intervene, work with community to try to get um, uh, less shots fired, recover guns, et cetera. So those are really important strategies, but you can see, and, and Dennis can certainly send you the maps, but you'll see, and the public should see it too, that we've got concentrations of uh, gun violence that are happening in certain zip codes in our community, and they correlate with you know, poverty and all those other, other things as well. And I believe that um, it's not just about the, the policing strategies, but also about really working together across our systems and with our community to try to figure out ways to do that intervention. I mean, this, this issue of um, the amount of gun violence that we have and the people that are dying, it's a moral issue. Yet I see that uh, there are things that are just stuck. And I just don't understand that, that we can't do everything that we can. We should be doing everything that we can. Uh, to save lives, and there's a whole comprehensive set of solutions, uh, but there's a, a group of them that are very intractable, nothing ever changes, and so I think what you're hearing from us is that we need to have action. Mm -hmm. And I just looked up to some yeah, of go ahead, the, sorry. the data I that like you can't about. quantify are the stories of the survivors the people that have been impacted by gun violence. And so um, we can certainly share the, you know, the, the amount of deaths that um, have resulted from gun violence in Ramsey County. But I just want to lift up um, what County Attorney Choi mentioned is that, you know, when you, when you have the cycle of violence happening, you also have to look at the social determinants of health that contribute to that. And so um, I think today I just want to lift up Healing Streets more and more that we are working. This is a, a newer program. Um, but that interruption of the cycle of violence is so important. And so I want to lift up those voices, those narratives from people that have lived experience in this space um, that have been impacted. Um, the numbers matter, but I think the stories and how we address action, as County Attorney Choi has mentioned, is so much more important to look at how we can do this from a public health lens and prevent and interrupt that cycle of violence. Does that give you any hope? Is this mm -hmm. the, this gun deal that's in Washington right now, is that what you would like to see pass? 
No, and I think Krista talked about it. It would be a good first step, right? We have to keep in mind that um, there's dysfunction, I think, in Washington, D.C., and so nothing has passed yet, right? So I wouldn't necessarily count on it. It's just good to hear that there was some conversation, that there are 10, I think, Republicans uh, that were a part of this conversation, uh, which I think addresses maybe the filibuster uh, issue. Um, and so optimi cautiously optimistic about that change, but again, the, the things that are in there are very, um, uh, they're not like major things. They don't, they don't address the whole gamut of things. So look, for instance, you talked about red flags. Well, by the way, the, if, if that becomes law, what it, will what it will do is it will just incentivize states to do something around passing red flag laws. We would have to still, in our legislature, pass something and then that federal legislation, I think the way that it's set up, would, that it would support uh, that work, right? So that's not necessarily, it's kind of a national solution by incentivizing states to do it, but states still have to do it. And it, let's think about Minnesota. Uh, we also got dysfunction up there, up at, at the state capitol, where things just don't seem to happen. You know, I, I don't understand how we have this huge public safety and justice crisis that's right at our doorstep. And the Democrats talk about A, B, and C, and the Republicans are talking about X, Y, and Z, and nothing happened around the issues of like, trying to make sure that all communities are safer, that we have a better version of justice. They all went home. There's one thing that changed, which was they, we did get a restoration of competency uh, program in place, which is huge. Um, but that was it. So we got a lot of work to do, and it, I think it starts with these types of conversations. It's not about who's right and who's wrong, it's about the people. And it's about serving the people and recognizing that this is a moral issue, it's a public health issue, that we've got people dying needlessly, and we need to have real solutions. So I'm hopeful about what <clears throat> might happen in D.C., um, but you know, there's a pattern there too, right? that certain special interests uh, have a huge uh, stranglehold on our democracy. And that's what needs to change as well. Last question. I have something to ask, John. John, you're off. I know you talked about being on the back end of the system. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to like brown states, you said you're also president. Have you looked at um, changing your approach to food orders or other aspects of your role in the system? No, the, the gun policy that we have is actually, it's one of the oldest policies that we have in our office. It was enacted by uh, my predecessor, Susan Gertner, uh, which is a, a, a no, uh, like, a, where we don't really plea bargain around the issue of um, the, ma the mandatory minimum, right? And so that policy has been in place for the longest time, and we haven't changed that. So that's one particular area in which uh, we will do our part to charge those cases, and then uh, as a part of the resolution, um, we have the policy that's been in place since the, the mid-90s. Now, uh, we have a report that we submit to the legislature by law every year, and in that report, you can see um, what happens to some of these cases, and in these cases would be the uh, ineligible possession. Uh, under Minnesota law, if you are a convicted felon, you are ineligible uh, to possess a firearm, right? So th we have to report that data uh, to the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commissions, and if you look at the data, you'll see uh, the positions that we've taken and then ultimately what happens uh, with the case, because the judge ultimately makes the final determination about whether to impose. Uh, the mandatory minimum. I would say across the state, though, uh, during this pandemic period, there's probably more cases that have probably been resolved uh, without that mandatory minimum. Uh, but that would be, I think those numbers are very much statewide because of the pandemic. But those are, I hope that addresses your question. That, that was the disposition issue. I mean, the legislature right. got very adamant about their feeling that particularly metro area prosecutors are not uh, getting tough on the front end. They want, to, they want to hold you and the Hennepin County in particular accountable. They say that people aren't, you know, getting charged out. But, it's not but if that's not on the gun cases, Tim, and I want to make that absolutely sure. clear, okay? On the, on the gun cases, absolutely not. We've been reporting that data for decades. 
uh, and so it's all there, and you're not going to see much of a change at all. I think their argument, though, is that yeah. other cases that lead to these gun cases are not, you know, that there's a... What, like fifth-degree drug possession cases? I, is I, that what you're saying? I don't. I, I, I think well, yeah. I mean, I do have a policy that says that we're not going to prosecute fifth-degree drug possession cases during the pandemic, which was supported by Sheriff Fletcher and uh, then Chief Mathwig in Roseville. We have this enormous backlog, and we have to prioritize these gun cases or the violent, the violent cases, right? And so, uh, over the course of this pandemic, you know, we have a, a policy that says that the rule is that we're not going to charge those unless the police uh, make a very uh, distinct case why there's a public safety issue. And recently, we've had some of those where we've got some livability issues, uh, like at Fifth and Minnesota, and some other places where the police have. Uh, presented cases and they've um, utilized the public safety exception that we have in our, our policy. Tim, the, the, the things that you're hearing up at the legislature, that clown show that occurred, okay, um, a lot of that is about politics. And it's about trying to get, gain control of the legislature. And that's what's wrong, is that people are putting their own political interests to take advantage of the fear that we have in society right now and to use that for partisan gain. We don't need any more games. What we need are real solutions uh, that actually work, right? And we need to stop this uh, positioning certain issues a certain way uh, to take advantage of the, the fear and the anxiety and stress there might be about crime and really get to uh, some solutions and, and real conversations. You know, it's really interesting that uh, nobody from the legislature on the GOP side uh, contacted anybody in that, that are living and working and tr on the front lines of trying to address the issues in St. Paul and Minneapolis. They just seem to think that, you know, uh, they've got a certain version of it. Uh, but interestingly, Congresswoman McCollum, she did contact us. She, con she convened uh, a group of people and started listening and what she heard was is that we could use more help and more support on developing uh, group violence intervention strategies, focus deterrence models and doing the work with community, right? And then she went to work and got us $900,000 to help us with that project. That those are the types of, that's the type of representation that we need to see from the state legislature that they work in partnership uh, with all of the local units of government and, and work to, you know, pull together in the same direction. That's really what we need, not this, like, let's see who can win the legislature and be in control. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um, Yeah, thank you.